Well, good morning and happy new year. I hope uh, all the hangover of, I've been talking to lots of you and it's not just like a Christmas meal here and there. It's like I had four Christmases, I had three Christmases. So perhaps you should not listen to Mike and do and take a re- indeed take some resolutions to eat less. I know I certainly do. Uh, Cindy and I are glad to be back. We had uh, a week or so uh, visiting uh, our family, my parents and uh, her brother on Vancouver Island. And uh, we had a great visit. Uh, you know, anytime you travel to those parts of the world, you compare climates. So I was comparing climates. I do feel like a good Albertan that I'll take minus five in the sun any day to like plus two in the wind and rain on the coast. But when it gets to minus 22 in the sun, I'll take the uh, plus two on the coast. So I don't know where I sit on that. Uh, before, I, uh, before I dive into what uh, I want to talk about this morning, uh, I do just want to springboard for a couple minutes just on what Mike said regarding uh, some of the blessings that God has given us as a church family in 2015. Uh, first of all, is just to make note of Christmas Eve. I've often talked up here saying when we come in summertime and we have our pancake breakfast, I've said this is the biggest outreach that we have uh, as a corporate body to the community of Cochrane. That's actually no longer true in that uh, this Christmas Eve we had just shy of 860 people uh, that were worshiping here with us on Christmas Eve between two services, and that uh, exceeds by quite a bit even the amount of people who come uh, for pancakes on Labor Day weekend. And so I want to thank those of you who uh, gave some of your time and used your, uh, your talents to share the story of Jesus with our friends uh, in this community. And I would even just put a little bug in your ear for next year. Perhaps <clears throat> you uh, uh, have music gifts. Uh, there are ways you can help us practically from ushering to uh, whatever. Uh, this is a major day that we have to share the story of Jesus. And uh, people are interested in hearing and God can do some great things. So we're, we're still kind of uh, riding the high off that, and uh, thank you, and, and urge you to consider uh, joining and sharing your gifts with us as we do that next year. Also, Mike gave you a little bit of a financial update on Open the Door, and uh, we're really excited about uh, how things are going to proceed. We anticipate that this is going to be the year we will see some construction happen on our site, and you can be in prayer uh, beyond the finances, which uh, continue to be, uh, we have significant need there, uh, but now we are in the process of seeking development permits from the town, which comes with uh, all kinds of uh, Uh, specific things we need to request and follow through on. And so you can pray for our building committee, uh, for our architects, our building contractor who are leading the charge for us there. I also wanted to let you know, uh, because Brad Smith, our treasurer at the beginning of December, uh, gave us a little bit of a financial update. And uh, in the middle of fall, we were about $34,000 behind budget in the um, the general fund, which is the the non-sexy fund that pays for lights and uh, programs and people's salaries. Um, as, uh, as you gave over the course uh, of December, today we find ourselves just uh, about $7,000 ahead of budget uh, for our general fund. So thank you for your generosity. As we begin uh, 2016, we, uh, for the next couple months, would like to go backwards to early in Scripture to the book of Genesis and also early in time to approximately 2000 BC to study uh, the story of Abraham. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to Genesis chapter 12? I feel uh, like I need to wear two hats uh, this morning. That is the hat of a teacher and the hat of a preacher. Of course, uh, I feel my role as a preacher is to help us understand the meaning of any given text that we've got in front of us. So we look at the Bible. My job is to help us understand that and then apply it to our lives today. And I certainly want to do that this morning. And I'm actually very excited as I've been beginning my research. uh, I'm excited about just how much there is in the story of Abraham to challenge us, to encourage us, uh, and to expand our view of God and of Jesus Christ. 
But I think to understand and apply any scripture, you've got to have some basic understanding of what's going on in the story and to sort out the historical information. And so I don't want to um, go too fast into applying lessons from Abraham without any concept of who he was or how he fits into the overarching biblical story. And so today in my role of teacher, I think it's important to spend a bit of time setting the context for a study of Abraham. And so I'd like to do that in two ways. One is to read uh, the beginning of his story as it's laid out in Genesis 11 and 12. And then to get a perspective on who this Abraham guy is, I'd like to use the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why. And I think that should be helpful in setting the context, not just for a study this morning, but for the next couple months. And so, let's go to the text first, book of Genesis. Uh, We're going to be mostly in chapter 12, but let's actually back up to chapter 11, verse 27. This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, let's start with uh, the W of when. When did this happen? Well, it seems the Bible would want us to put the patriarchs in the first half of the second millennium. So that would be somewhere between 2100 and 1500 BC. So when we come to these stories about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we are in the very ancient world. Lots of times we got to do translation from culture when we're speaking about Jesus in Roman times, but we have to go 2,000 years before Jesus to customs, worldviews, behaviors of people that are very different than us, very foreign from what we hold is true. For example, Sarai... Abram's wife is actually his half-sister, his father Terah's daughter by a different mother. So uh, later on in the Bible, uh, you'll know that God puts pretty explicit regulations about marrying your sister. And actually, we know genetically, not a good idea to marry your sister nowadays. Uh, But in these times, it was something acceptable. When you follow Lot's trajectory, that's Abram's nephew, you get strange stories about attempted gang rape. And Abraham has slaves and sleeps with one of his wives' slaves who gets pregnant, which causes all kinds of challenges. It seems strange. It seems weird that that's in the Bible, that that this is supposedly a good guy. How is he living like this? The bottom line, I would say for right now, is don't expect Abraham to conform to your current set of values. God patiently worked with people more than 4,000 years ago, just like he patiently works with people today who don't have all their junk together. Actually, this is a very important part of the story. This is part of God's plan. He didn't choose to bless Abraham and his family because they were so advanced and ahead of their time or because they were really smart or because they were extraordinarily good. He chose them because he, God, was gracious. That's it. Secondly, who? Who who are these people? 
Well, Genesis chapter 11 traces the lineage of one of Noah's sons, Shem, after the flood. And uh, I won't embarrass myself by walking through it and by uh, naming all these names. Uh, but he goes, uh, the writer goes from Shem all the way down to Nahor, who was the father of Terah. And then it's as though, uh, with this little pause at verse 27, this is the account of Terah. It's as though the camera lens zooms in in a special way to say, and now we are going to tell you the important story of Terah's family. Terah has three sons mentioned here, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And uh, notably, Abram's brother Haran dies, leaving some orphans, Lot and two girls. And uh, you're going to see that Lot is going to show up in Abraham's story a lot. Get it? Yeah. All right. Um, also, very notable is Abram's wife, Sarai, who it just kind of stands out like a sore thumb as this account is being read. Sarai is barren, which means in these times that Abram's legacy as a person is in serious jeopardy. All these, these great patriarchs having kids, having sons, the story advancing, and then with Abraham, boom, no kids. It's a, a bit of a hint that there's something big going to happen there. Also notice that Abram and Sarai are not young people. When the story picks up, Abram is 75 years old and Sarai is about 65. Uh, and note to those of you who are seniors this morning, although Abraham and Sarah have unusual longevity, they were nonetheless old people. And it's actually a very big part of the story. They keep referencing how old they are, how dried up they are, how it's crazy that they're still living, that they can't have kids. And it's not just me. That's them commenting on their old story. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I want to just point out, as a side note, that even though they had already many, many years under their belt, their adventure in life and with God was just beginning at 75 and 65. And so I would ask those of you who are that age, whoever said that your most important years take place before so-called retirement. There is no retiring until God calls you out of the action. I say that cautiously as a 40-year-old. What about where? Where does all this stuff take place? Terah's family, uh, the Bible says, lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur of the Chaldeans refers to a, a, a rather large ancient city in southern Mesopotamia, as you can see at the bottom of the map there. Uh, the thing is, sometimes as the story goes along, Abram talks about where he came from, and he's often talking about northeast Mesopotamia, where that Ur possible location note is. Um, when the Bible talks about where Abraham came from, it often wants to put him there, which later on would become the place of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Uh, and as you know, Babylon's going to feature big in Israel's history. So the Bible most often wants to put Abraham in that location of uh, Ur. And it seems that while he's in Ur, God speaks to Abraham and tells him to leave everything that's familiar, his entire family, and go to a place that he would show him. And God doesn't actually spell out where that place is, although we know it to be the land of Canaan, the promised land, or the land promised to Abraham, and later Isaac, and later Jacob, and then to all their descendants. The, la the, the land we know today as Israel and Palestine. And so, while living in Ur, the whole family, including his dad, Terah, his brother, his nephew, and their families head out along a common trading route. They head northwest, but they don't get any further than the city of Haran. And Terah decides that he's going to settle down there, and that's where Abram's dad eventually dies. But it's in that city, in Haran, that Abraham eventually makes his move to unilaterally respond to the word of God, and he takes all of his people and moves southwest to Canaan. And he journeys down there, and he, when he gets to the gateway city of Shechem, he builds a, uh, an altar, basically planting a flag for God in Canaan, even though there's a bunch of people there who have all the property rights, and he doesn't own any of it, but he kind of builds an altar and said, okay, God, I'm here. 
And by the second half of chapter 12, which I was hoping to get to today, but we won't, Abram actually settles in Egypt for a time. So if we zoom out, uh, you'll see a little bit bigger area there uh, in Northeast Africa. We have Egypt. Uh, because of a famine, Abram decides that he needs to get out of the promised land and head to Egypt to preserve his family. And he gets booted out of there because of some strange things that happened. Uh, but there you have the geography of Abraham's story. And what's very interesting is now you have the geography of the entire Old Testament. That's where everything takes place. We just did a little bit of Genesis 11 and all of chapter 12, and we've got the setting for the entire Old Testament. People of Israel living in the promised land, eventually through, uh, because of Joseph, they go to where? Egypt. Then they come out of Egypt, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We're in Egypt. We're heading into the promised land. We're taking the promised land. Then a bunch of stuff happens there, and eventually because of disobedience, the Jews are taken to Babylon, and that's where they hang out for a long time until God brings them back to the promised land. And so just in this little picture of Abram's life, we actually get the, the landscape, the stage to set for the entire Old Testament. What about the question of why? Why study this? Well, there are more reasons than I can list this morning, but let me give you three. The Old Testament and a good chunk of the New Testament is the unfolding story of the descendants of Abraham. So to understand what's going on in the Bible, you need to know how it all got started with the children of Israel, and more specifically about the God who got it all started. And that, of course, is the story of Abraham. Secondly, and more broadly speaking, God's plan to fix everything that is wrong with the world begins with Abraham. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. As crazy as it may sound to your ears or mine, the Creator has decided that He would start with one ancient guy in the place we now know as Iraq and use him and his descendants, both physical and spiritual, to change the course of the world history. It's that big. Abraham's story has implications for every single human being. And you know the song. You perhaps have danced to it. Father Abraham has many sons. And many sons has Father Abraham, and I am, and so are. So let's just praise the Lord, and then we'll get that going. I'll leave that to Matt, okay? <laughs> How is it possible that Abraham is our father if you and I are not Jews genetically? Well, we're going to find out. But the Apostle Paul says that somehow Abraham is the father of us all. And third, not to give away the climax of the story here, but for us as Christians, we know that Jesus is a Jew, a son of Abraham. And so, the story of the founder of our faith, the story of the Son of God, can be traced all the way back here to Abraham. So what about the what? As in, what happened at the beginning of Abraham's story? And let's use this as a springboard to hear from what God is saying to us this morning. I want us to pretend, if we can, that we are Abraham. And you grow up as a kid, as a young man, as a middle-aged guy, as we would define it. You grow up in your father's house, and he's not fabulously wealthy, but he's well-to-do nonetheless. And you live in one of the happening urban centers on the planet, in Ur, and not only are things moving along in your life, you've also got your own spirituality. Basically, Abram was worshiping whatever idols his father had worshipped. Actually, later in the Old Testament, uh, the Psalms comment how that, that Terah was worshiping the gods of his fathers. There's lots of speculation about who those gods were, but we don't know. And out of the blue, a god who you haven't met maybe a God you've never even heard before, speaks to you. Now, it's not that 
Abram got a vision or that God showed up or there was an angel or a miracle or a burst of flame. All that scripture said is he heard. He heard God speak. And this God does not have a name or an image or a temple, and he speaks somehow. Leave your city, leave your family, leave your inheritance that comes with the family that you would stay with, and go somewhere. I'm not even telling you where that somewhere is, but somewhere I will show you. And at this point, when God first speaks to Abram, he doesn't even tell him that he's getting some land or that he'll inherit some land. He's just supposed to go somewhere. And that same God, previously unknown to you, says that he is going to act in incredibly significant ways in your life. I want to bless you. Your life is going to count for something. You are going to make a difference in the world, a desire that all of us as human beings have. I'd like my life to be significant. I'd like this for, to count something for something. I'd like there to be some meaning. And this God promises, I can guarantee that. Not only that, I'm going to make a whole nation out of you. And eventually, every people group in the world is going to be blessed through you. I promise. Right. Who is this, really? Imagine, if you're Abram, that you are meeting your buddies for coffee the next morning. Hey, guys, uh, I'm thinking of moving. Great, where are you going to move? Not sure, really. Well, where did you get the idea? God told me. Well, which God? Well, he didn't give me a name, but he did promise to show me where the new place will be, and he promised that he was going to really bless me and bless other people, and eventually the whole world is going to be blessed through me. And, oh yeah, my descendants will one day become a great nation. But you and Sarai can't get pregnant. Yeah, uh, I mean, no, we can't. What do you think, if they're good friends, these friends are going to say to Abram? You really think this invisible God can make a bunch of somethings from absolutely nothing? Apparently, Abram thought so. Verse 4. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had, at this time, appeared to him. And then a whole bunch of action unfolds in Abram's life, which we will dive into in the coming weeks. But let's play, if you'll allow me, spoiler for a moment, and see where Abram is at the end of his life. What does he actually have to show for this great promise and this great step of faith by the time he dies at the ripe old age of 175? You can read all about it in Genesis 25. Certainly, Abraham is a wealthy man by the time he dies, but how about this land promised him? Does he finally get the promised land? Well, a hundred years later, the only land that Abram owns is a field with a cave on it, which he uses to bury his wife, Sarai. And eventually he himself gets buried there. That's it. What about all those descendants through him and Sarai that God would promise? At the end of his life, he has one, count it, one son with Sarai. He has some kids with some other women. We'll save those stories for a little later. But by the end of his life, the promise of being a great nation had gone from zero people to one person. He does get a name change from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, father of many, but there were not many. There is no great nation. Only, by the end of Abraham's story, only another far-off promise from God that in another 500 years, 500 years, think, 2,516, 
How far ahead are you thinking about your life and your legacy? Does it even, even bother to think about 500 years in the future? But that's what God gave Abraham, that in 500 years, he would finally have many, many descendants, and they would return from weird slavery in Egypt and finally take control of the land that he was promised. And how about all that stuff about blessing the entire world? I doubt Abraham ever understood how that was going to work out. Do you ever have a hard time, as a Christian, hanging on to everything we're supposed to believe? Because sometimes, if I'm honest with myself, the evidence around us seems to cast doubt on the existence and the involvement of Abraham's God in our world. Life seems, to my natural eyes, to unfold as it always has. For a lot of good people, it seems plausible that things exist just because they exist. That our world is, in scientific terms, a closed system. That is, it's self-contained. What is just is. There is nobody out there who intervenes. There are no miracles. There are just the laws of physics and biology. It's science, gravity, geology, light. Science is what explains things. Time moves forward and a bunch of random events play out and it doesn't always seem that there's a lot of meaning to it. It's just, well, luck. It's chance. You win some, you lose some, and then you die. And let's not make fun of people who believe that because I think it makes sense. There are lots of people who believe this way and they can certainly make their case for their belief because there's evidence that it's just what it is. It's natural. There's no super... It's just natural. And then there's Christianity. With our take about the origin of everything, a God who spoke and out of nothing came something. None of us in this room have seen God and yet we claim that he speaks to us all through a book, through something called the inner testament of the Holy Spirit. And then we have this way that we look at world history and our belief that the world is not a closed system, that every day God is at work with a plan, that he's in charge, that he hears and answers prayers, that he keeps his promise, like this promise he made to some random Middle Eastern guy. That part of God keeping his promise to Abraham was to come himself, that we, we believe that somehow in Jesus as the son of Abraham, that he came to deal with our sin and our brokenness, that we believe in Jesus, that he, he brought life out of death, and that he really wants to bless us as we trust in him. And then, someday, 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 we sing about it every week, someday, in the future, on the, in our dying day, when we see it, someday we'll see it, someday God is going to give us what he promised, eternal life, peace, with one another, rest, fulfillment, that that's coming. But all of that, the proof, the hard in your face proof, there it is, that all of this is real, that God's promises can be trusted, well, it all just has to be believed. And we have to take God's word on it to keep looking ahead in faith. A bunch of years ago, there was a group of Abraham's descendants who had actually converted to Christianity who were wondering the same thing, who were struggling with the same doubts. They were wondering in their situation if it was worth it to hang on to God's promises, to believe that Jesus meant something, that all the, the suffering they were facing was going to amount to something. And some of them were tempted to quit, to just say, forget it, it's stupid. I'm, I just, I just want to believe like everyone else because this does not seem worth it. And they got a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit that we now know as the book of Hebrews. And in part of the letter, they were reminded of their father, Abraham. And this is how that part goes. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. 
He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were strangers and foreigners on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. This is why Christians are called people of faith. Not people of evidence, although there is evidence. Nor are we called people of proof, although there is proof. Nor are we called people of reason, although there is reason to believe. God, just like our father Abraham, has gifted us with a divine imagination. We take our lead from Abraham who put his hope and confidence in God's word even when all the pieces did not add add up logically. Even when we can't see how it will all pan out. Even if the payoff does not come in this life but in the one that is still ahead of us. So my friends, it is the beginning of a brand new year, 2016. Our faith is in a God who can make something from nothing, who brings death, he brings out of death life. With the help of the Holy Spirit, let's move ahead with faith in Him, believing God and obeying Him even when it's hard. No shrinking back, no turning around. When I was looking to uh, conclude this, um, I was in some ways tempted to follow in the uh, tradition of many preachers of long ago, always finished up their sermons with poetry. I'm not much of a poet. But there's been a song that uh, in 2015 was the um, basic soundtrack of my life. I'm sure it's got more than 300 plays on my iPad. Um, and it's by a guy named Josh Garrels. Probably not many of you listen to Josh Garrels. But he wrote a song a few years ago called Beyond the Blue. And Beyond the Blue is about having faith in believing that what God has for us beyond what we can see with our own eyes is what's worth living for and living as, as foreigners and strangers on the earth. And he pulls imagery and words from all over the Bible. If you pay attention, you'll see him grabbing imagery from everywhere. But I, uh, I, sometimes when I play songs for people, I go, you got to hear this great song and it's like, a, that ministers to you but not me, but I'm going to take a chance. So let's uh, listen to Josh Garrell's Beyond the Blue And uh, I trust that maybe it'll minister to your soul as you sojourn into 2016. And then I'll come back and pray. I don't see the substance of what dwells in me Cause my natural eyes on the ghost skin deep But the eyes of my heart anchor Plumb in the depths to the place in between The tangible world and the land of the dream Because everything here ain't quite what it seems There's more beneath the appearance of things A beggar could be king within the shadows of Yeah, wisdom will honor everyone who will learn to listen, to love, and to pray, and 
discern and to do the right thing even when it burns and to live in the life through each treacherous turn. A man is weak, but the spirit yearns to keep to the course from the bow to the stern and to throw overboard every selfish concern that tries to work for what can't be earned sometimes. The only way to return is to go where the winds will take. Let go of all you can. Pray with me. Father, uh, all of us are on our journey in life. We got some great grandmas and grandpas here. We got a little boy who's a week into his journey. And it's a long one. It's a hard one. There's lots of distractions, and it's difficult to see what the end game is. And then you speak to us. You've spoken to many, hundreds of people that are here. Maybe you are speaking right now to someone for the first time. And you say, look, lift your eyes off the road in front of you and look up to what I am doing, how I want to bless you how I have a plan, and how you're a part of it. Give us ears to ear and feet that will obey so we can follow in the steps of our father Abraham. Give us the kind of faith that sticks. Amen. Amen.